good evening everyone um, welcome to the design histories of modern and contemporary india a symposium series uh, that imami art is hosting in collaboration with uh, tapati guru takurti we are also thankful to our outreach partners nid and jadunath bhavan museum kolkata tapati could not be here today um, but we have with us Mortimer Chatterjee, who is going to present a discussion on design within the Indian gallery space. This is the eighth lecture within our series. Tomorrow we have with us Vishal Khandelwal. So let me introduce uh, Mort's lecture and Mort himself. Today's lecture is designed from the eras of modern and contemporary India on the precipice of receiving significant academic and commercial interest. Maud says that this will be analogous to the period beginning in 2004 when contemporary Indian art found its voice in the world. Given the absence of institutional support for the field, art galleries and design galleries will undoubtedly play an important role in the discourse around design and its histories. Since 2017, Chatterjee and Lal has hosted a number of design-related exhibitions, and in 2022, they opened a design gallery in Mumbai. This presentation will focus on aspects of their programming with a view to investigating an allied question, why has the contemporary Indian art ecosystem found it hard to incorporate design into an understanding of its own history? Mortimer Chatterjee founded, co-founded Chatterjee and Lal with his wife Tara Lal in 2003, as well as 47A, a design gallery in 2022. Based in Mumbai, the galleries are focused on contemporary and historical material Chatterjee has authored and co-authored several publications and is editor of an evolving series of publications on disciplines across the arts and culture spectrum, the first of which is focused on modern and contemporary art from the Indian subcontinent. Welcome, Mott. The floor is yours. And a little housekeeping rules. Um, we will take questions at the end of the session. For our friends watching on Facebook, do write in your questions and we will try and accommodate as many towards the end of the session. It's a pleasure to have you here, Mort. Thank you so much, Vishmita. Thank you. Um, is the screen sharing working? Yes. Perfect. Um, well, thanks to uh, Imami, to Tapati, and to Ushmita for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Um, I've had uh, the great pleasure of watching some of the earlier sessions. Um, I feel somewhat overawed by the company that you've put me in, Ushmita. This is uh, a serious uh, group of uh, people. So um, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Having spoken with you, uh, earlier about how to proceed with the presentation, we both agreed that uh, it would be somewhat more focused on practice and a little less on theory. Um, I think that's the right way to go. I'm really excited to share some of the projects we've been involved with over the last five to six years, uh, which have incorporated design. So uh, without further ado, I will uh, begin my presentation. So I really feel that a gallerist's role is both human-centric as also object-centric. On one hand, the gallerist is a conduit for others to express themselves creatively, and here I would include both makers and curators, and for audiences to gain access to that creativity. And on the other hand, it is a space to allow objects to gain context. I am deeply interested in what happens to an object when it enters the gallery space and what histories it begins to speak to when this happens. It is my contention that the commercial gallery scene for art in India 
have began taking this question seriously in the early 2000s, and that we can expect a similar phenomenon to occur soon for galleries dedicated to showing historical and contemporary design material. I am indebted to the ideas of early 20th century French philosopher Maurice Halbwax and his theories on collective memory, and also to French historian Pierre Nora's concept of les lieux de mémoire, or in English, memory sites, which he first wrote about in the late 1980s. And these have helped shape my thinking around how conversations on design histories might proceed, especially now that an increasingly large cohort of professionals are working with design within a gallery context. Here I am thinking of practitioners, historians, critics, writers, and of course, the commercial players. Interestingly, of course, at the moment, the state is largely absent from this conversation. Let me just first start by talking a little bit about Chatterjee and Lal and our own history um, with art. We began showing in 2004, and in 2007, we moved into a gallery space in the Kolaba area of South Mumbai. Um, it has a deep and rich commercial history. Um, here are the buildings we're presently occupying as they were in the 18th century, used originally to store cotton and coal for the ships. Um, these warehouse spaces for many decades in the 20th century, quite dilapidated. And then a number of us moved into them in around the mid uh, 2000s. So this is the space uh, as we found it pretty much in 2007. And here we are uh, with our first ever inaugural exhibition in August of that year. And really from the beginning, our interest was in showing both contemporary art as well as historical material. And really the reason for that is because it's our firm conviction that contemporary art doesn't happen in a vacuum. It comes laden with histories and memories, both acknowledged as well as unconscious. And as an example here, I bring to focus the work of Nikhil Chopra. And indeed, this was an exhibition that the artist hosted soon after we uh, moved into the building that I showed you earlier. He occupied the third floor of the building. And for those of you who are not familiar with Nikhil's practice, he is predominantly a performance artist and undertakes durational pieces wherein he will occupy a space for an allotted amount of time and an audience often is encouraged to engage with the persona he's inhabiting by sitting throughout the day, throughout the night, no boundaries between where the uh, artist is exhibiting and where the audience can encroach. Uh, there's a sort of a free flowing inter interaction as it were. And for Bombay, this performance was quite revelatory. And of course, Nikhil worked very closely with the history of the building, with the histories of the area. So here is a contemporary artist clearly working at many registers of which the histories, uh, cultural material histories, as well as art histories are important. So here in this sequence of images, you see the artist evolving a character over time. And as he does that, he builds up this 360 degree, degree panorama of the Bombay skyline. And old Bombay, contemporary Bombay, fixed cheek by jowl together, again, talks to this kind of palimpsest of histories and contemporary working together.
And so too, we showed uh, in, in the early years of the gallery, in fact, this was just prior to beginning the gallery in Kolaba, we hosted a exhibition of Amrita Sher Gill's last ever sketchbook made just before her death in 1941, which included not only sketches, but also archival material from uh, the estate of her husband, Victor Egan. And this exhibition really, again, pointed to this idea of excavating perhaps forgotten or lesser known histories of the 20th century. Cher Gill's canvas is of course extremely well known, but these sketches at that point in time in the, in the early 2000s, very little known. And in fact, the sketch that you see here on the screen is the preparatory sketch for her penultimate canvas. So for the same reason that we felt it was important to excavate art histories, it also felt important to do the same with design histories, especially as there was so much cross-pollination evident throughout the 20th century between art and design. I'm going to now pick out a few examples of that. And the first is an exhibition we hosted in 2017, which was called Leela, Play in Indian Visual Culture. Fantasy was a Mumbai-based company set up in the early 1930s. Originally, it was known as Rhymeland, and it specialized in making nursery furniture for children, obviously. Now, Fantasy's owners had the good sense to employ perhaps a gentleman who would go on to be India's most famous artist of the 20th century, M.F. Hussain. And between 42 and 49, Hussain was the chief designer for Fantasy. Uh, we had been working with the estate of fantasy for a number of years uh, prior to uh, putting on an exhibition. And it became increasingly clear to us that there was something very special going on in the years between 1942 and 1949 within the context of Hussein's role as a designer. Now, what was that? Here you can see uh, some Advertisements for the company on the left-hand side and on the upper right and bottom right, these are sketches for room layouts, which Hussein would have designed. And as you can see, the aesthetic is informed by Western uh, mass culture. We've sort of got Disney characters, uh, Daffy Duck and Mickey Mouse and so on. And here on the left also you've got sort of um, on the Seven Dwarves or something like that. At some point, there's a breakthrough in the way that Hussein and the owner of fantasy, that is uh, Elias Moizuddin, approached the aesthetics of uh, the design for fantasy. And here and you see in the image in the middle, uh, suddenly a distinctly indigenous flavor. And the breakthrough seems to have happened somewhere around 1944. We have a letter which Hussein writes to a friend of his in Baroda, where he says, Elias Moizuddin, the owner of Fantasy, agrees with me that we can't keep churning out the same designs in nursery furniture day in and day out. I have, in fact, designed a whole range based on themes from Indian villages and folklore, with the cupboards, painted like an entrance to a hut. I thoroughly enjoyed doing this, particularly after painting nursery rhymes over pastel blues or pink backgrounds. But wait and watch. I'm going to start replacing Jack and Jill and Humpty Dumpty with stories from the Pachatantra. So much more colorful and meaningful. I hope people will like the changes I have introduced. As you know, most of our clients are more English than the English. And here on the right, you see a very recently discovered, rediscovered uh, furniture set with this incredible lotus design. So you can see Hussein suddenly breaking out of uh, 
a strict paradigm of a Western aesthetic into this entirely newly conceived um, indigenous one. And of course, this feeds in to uh, work which he's doing otherwise. I'll also uh, just touch upon a little bit of archival material we found. And here is an article from 1948 with an interview with Elias Moizuddin. I'll just refer you here on the image on the left to the second column, second paragraph, where he said, where the reporter says, today, Mr. Moizuddin is busy Indianizing the appearance of his nursery. With an eye to the future, he is searching into the gathering folklore and children's rhymes of different provinces, which can be put into picture. He believes that even the badly wanted communal harmony can be established by designing such furniture and decorating the kindergarten classes in such a way as to completely remove the communal complex from the child. So here, a very bold statement about the power of design within the politics of the nation at that time. I find that a deeply moving uh, passage. And on the right-hand side, this extraordinary letter of recommendation written in 1949, again by Elias Moizuddin, wherein I would refer you to the second page here. He says, in 1949, don't forget, we hope his, being Hussein's, we hope his artistic ability will be properly appreciated in this country and that he will be recognized as one of the great artists of our time someday in the near future. So in fact, Rebecca Brown spoke in an earlier uh, Design History Symposium se uh, session about the middleman, the entrepreneur. And here you see someone like Elias Moizuddin directly intervening or uh, being part of Hussein's trajectory, which I find uh, very interesting. So what we did uh, in the exhibition itself is we took three different approaches to the fantasy furniture. The first was to look at the role or the child's role in middle-class Indian families in the early 20th century. And to do that, we worked with the Netherlands-based anthropologist, Olga Saudi, who wrote an extraordinary piece actually looking at that uh, entire realm and at how it fit in within the uh, coming design aesthetics for furniture, uh, for, for nursery furniture and for um, looking at how children were accommodated within the home. The second was thinking about the influences on the visual imagery employed by Hussein at that time and how he came about thinking through this move from a Western to, uh, to the village or finding the village in, in the design um, language of fantasy. And the third was taking from a book written in 1950 by Johann Heusinger. It's his masterpiece, Homo Ludens, uh, which looks at the central position of play in culture around the world. And so this allowed us an entry point into the nursery of furniture and allowed us to create conversations with other objects that spoke to the idea of play and especially framed around the idea of cosmic play. And in this slide, you see images of Chola bronzes, of video art juxtaposed against design drawings by Hussein for fantasy. So in the upper left there, you see baby Krishna approaching an idol. And this is one of the uh, original designs which would have ultimately have been executed as a wooden cutout and then uh, put onto a piece of furniture, a cupboard or a bed or something of that sort. Here on the right, um, maybe if, here on the right, you can see another design by Hussein of uh, carts, toy carts, carriages, and those we had displayed against or close to classical works. Uh, these are terracotta fragments from 
around 300 BCE to 300 CE, uh, which included then toy carts, uh, which of course were widely disseminated uh, at that time uh, across India, um, right from the north northeast to the northwest of the country. And on the right-hand side, we then get some signposts into Hussein's experiments with toys, which actually lasted far beyond his relationship with fantasy, right into the 1950s and indeed 1960s. He was collaborating with communities uh, who were engaged with making uh, wooden toys. In fact, there's a, a very nice sequence uh, in a film made around the 1950s, uh, 1960s, I'm sorry, which shows Hussein working with uh, artisans on these pieces. Moving on from Leela, I would now like to turn to an exhibition we hosted in 2018. It was called Impact, Design Thinking and the Visual Arts in Young India. And I think it should come as no surprise that many of the people who I have looked to as mentors have been part of the Design Symposium, uh, Design History Symposium in some fashion. In fact, it was a conversation with Professor Ashok Chatterjee, which really was the impetus in many ways for this exhibition. And in particular, his notions of design as service and his credo um, therein, which really formed the bedrock for the exhibition. For impact, we focused on individuals, groups, and institutions which were active soon after independence, uh, working at the intersection between art and design. People like Pupu Jacob, Haku Shah, KG Subramanian, uh, Prabhaka Barwe, Haku Shah, uh, and uh, uh, Jyoti Bhatt. The creative promiscuity that this exhibition celebrated incorporated disciplines as diverse as book design, animation, advertising, industrial design, industrial photography, textiles, and painting. The two key institutions that functioned as anchors for the exhibition were the National Institute of Design, the NID in Ahmedabad, and the Pan India Initiative of the Weaver Service Center. In both cases, cross-disciplinary thinking was a key driver to the success of these institutions. Of course, the history of the setting up of the NID is extremely well known and really doesn't need recapping in this uh, context today. I'm really showing you these images because I wanted to give you a sense for how the exhibition uh, itself was uh, conceived at the gallery. And in fact, in 2015, the NID's photography design department had begun the Herculean task of archiving the Institute's massive wealth of material collected during its history. Uh, this project involved digitizing, metadata, metadata tagging, data organization, and physical reorganization. And um, peripheral research required the study of all available sources, including the extensive use of oral histories. Uh, Impact was lucky enough to showcase four of the archiving projects undertaken by former students of the NID photography uh, design group. And uh, the gallery was fortunate enough to gain access to the material and display the photo books, which were the outcome of the projects. So here you can see some of the uh, photographs we displayed. So in the previous uh, slide, you saw obviously uh, Ray Eames, who along with Charles had initially created the India Report in 58, and then were so influential and critical in, in the establishment of NID itself. And then in this slide on the left-hand side, the very person who first invited them to write that report, Pupu Jaka, and here flanked by Fry Otto, who of course came to India, uh, to, to NID, to uh, teach as uh, visiting faculty. And on her right, uh, on her left, our right, is Dr. Homi Baba, 
who, uh, sorry, Dr. Jahangir Baba, this is uh, Jamshed Baba, even. This is, uh, that's a mistake in the slide. Um, Jamshed Baba was the um, initiator of the NCPA in Mumbai and a key institution builder along with his brother, Homi Baba, during the 1960s. And on the right, J.R.D. Tata, along with another of the uh, inspirations behind NID, Gautam Sarabhai. And here in the next slide, we have other major figures in the early years of NID. Helena Perentupa, who sadly passed away recently, who set up the textiles department at NID. Moving on from NID, uh, we also were interested, as I said earlier, in the genesis of the Weaver Service Center. Pupu Jaka made monumental contributions to the government's policies on Indian crafts as chairman of the All India Handloom Board. She identified the need for an All India body that would catalyze and transform the traditional design aesthetic of the weaver within a more contemporary framework. This paved the way for the establishment of the WSC in 1955, initially operating out of four centers across the country. From the outset, the Weaver Service Center recruited artists from the fine arts sector, many of whom had no formal textile experience. Rather than putting in place a plan for large scale production, the idea was to allow artists to create design samples in the spirit of experimentation. And indeed, there were an astonishing number of artists associated with the Weaver Service Center since its inception, including KG Subramaniam, Manu Parekh, Jairam Patel, Jogan Chowdhury, Himat Shah, Shona Ray, Amrit Patel, Alpita Singh, Haku Shah. And here we have examples by Prabhaka Barwe, who for many years was associated with the Weaver Service Center. And it became for an artist like Barwe an incredibly important resource financially uh, to sustain himself whilst creating a parallel career in the fine arts. Another artist who I just mentioned who was keenly involved with the Weaver Service Centre was K.G. Subramanian, who between 59 and 61 was engaged uh, with the organisation. And here are drawings, uh, designs from that period exceptionally rare pieces which were displayed for the first time in impact. We also looked at industrial photography. In 2015, Chatterjee and Lal hosted an exhibition by, of photographs by Sunil Jana. Uh, it was called A Modern Vision. And it was the first time that industrial photography by Sunil Jana had ever been displayed in a gallery context on this scale. And it was incredibly important for us to include him because of the manner in which he articulates uh, this Nehruvian drive for institution building at that particular moment. Uh, this, the idea of the new temples of concrete and gleaming steel uh, which began to tower over the rice fields, as Jana himself said. And of course, for us, it was incredibly exciting also, also to see these photographs as they seem to talk so closely to Jana's uh, friend and perhaps mentor, Margaret Bork White, the photog American photographer who was also engaged with photographing industrial uh, sites at about the same time. Indeed, Malvika Singh, who wrote for us uh, for the exhibition, says she sees the Jana's Ovra as the foremost archive of India in transition. Allied to Sunil Jana's photographs, we showed Mitta Bedi's important works. Uh, and here you see photographs commissioned by Godrej uh, through Hindustan Thompson around the 1970s. Beatty uh, was really the father in, of industrial uh, 
design photography and in fact taught at NID and took on many prestigious assignments for corporations, not only like Godrej, but Air India and Levers, Standard Vacuum, oil company, later Hindustan uh, Petroleum. Uh, by the time of his death in 1985, Beatty had photographed more than 2,000 installations spanning a wide range of industries, from steel, fertilizers, and textiles to paper, sugar, and pharmaceuticals. Here, uh, you see examples from Air India's tryst with uh, design. The commercial director of the Air India Publicity Department uh, during the 1960s, 70s was Mr. Bobby Kuka. The art director was Carl Kawasji, Jal Kawasji. Between them, they were responsible for the look and feel of design at the airline. The Air India Maharaj was debuted in 1946, and it was drawn by Umesh Rao, an artist with the advertising agency J. Walter Thompson. Over the next half century, a plethora of material was generated by the publicity department. Side by side, the airline was aggressively acquiring a first-class Indian art collection, incorporating examples from across art historical periods. It was only natural, therefore, that artists were often asked to collaborate on design projects. And here you see uh, B. Prabha's designs, uh, her artworks for the design of onboard menus. So moving into how the exhibition uh, looked in the gallery, we were keen to create a flow where an audience could engage somewhat chronologically uh, with a range of different media. We engaged them first with the history of NID and then moved on uh, to other areas such as the Weaver Service Center. For us, it was very important to juxtapose the images I described earlier, which you see on the right-hand side of this slide. Those are Subramanian's Weaver Service Center designs with the artworks you see on the left-hand side. These are drawings he made in the mid 1960s, about four or five years after the designs for what we the service center. And it seemed clear to us that the relationship between the designs he made for Weaver service center and then the markers works, which he made during and after his Rockefeller residency in New York showed clear resonance with each other. And so for us, this was the most wonderful example of this kind of intersection between art and design at that point in time in the 1960s. Here on the left hand side are images of Haku Shah's works, a sari he designed during the Weaver Service Center period, and then a painting he actually exhibited for a group show with which the Weaver Service Center had organized in the 1980s. On the right hand side, in an unusual move, we actually incorporated an exhibition capsule within the overarching framework of our exhibition that is Impact. Uh, first seen at KNMA Noida in 2017, the souvenir shop exhibition was curated by Akansha Rastogi and created a meeting ground for a crisscross of institutional histories comprising both artworks and archival material from a host of artists, collectives, and organizations active in post-independence India. And it seemed apt to us to invite Akansha to display aspects of her exhibition uh, souvenir shop within the context of impact. So on the right-hand side, you have two, two works which uh, were borrowed from her exhibition. And lastly then, these are the images of the Air India uh, material that we had on display on the left and on the right, we have Hussein's fantasy work, Mitter Bedi's work for Godrej, Sunil Jana's photography, and again, examples of Hussein's toys from the 1950s, 1960s.
Now, this exhibition has already been um, touched on by Ushmita, of course, during the Design History Symposium. So uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Suffice to say, uh, Ritain Muzumda, uh, having graduated in 1950 with a diploma in art from Shantiniketan, pursued a career in design, uh, going on to be recognized as one of the greatest artist designers of the 20th century. In 1957, after pursuing further art studies in Europe, he was taken on as a textile designer at Printex Marimekko in Helsinki, Finland. And here you see on the right-hand side, an image of a screen print uh, from that period. Having moved back to India, Muzumda worked on a plethora of different media and sites, uh, working at diff drastically dr different scales, both from large scale expos, as you see on the right hand side here, and on the left, a commission for a hotel in Bangalore, to the intimate scale of apparel. And on the right hand side, we can see his own home designed, built by Charles Courier. Muzumda was an incredible figure who was at the center of so many conversations and so many intimacies with different figures within the design sphere at that time, Courier being just one. Uh, he, for instance, worked with the Delhi-based furniture company Daru, headed by Mini Boga, and was involved with furniture, and of course, most lastingly, he was one of the chief designers for Fab India. And here on the left, you see one of his iconic designs from the 1970s. And this was a relationship that lasted many decades and saw Mazumda's designs literally becoming a, a part of the fabric of everyday life in India. Apart from all this, he continued a relationship with painting, which was of course first birthed at Shantiniketan and his early training with Bibi Mukherjee in Nepal and his interest in sculpture also uh, being born at that time. And here on the right hand side, you have a late painting by the artist. In an illuminating 2016 essay on Mazunda published in Art and Deal magazine, Bushmitter provides a sense for the polymath creative instincts of Muzumda. She says, Muzumda's practice was varied and his oeuvre ranged from painting, sculptures, toys, small objects to textiles, murals and furniture to complete design solutions for interiors and large complexes. It was this article which led me to Bushmitter and after a year or so in planning, we were lucky enough to have her co-curator re retrospective on Mazumda, the first since his death. And this, uh, these are images from uh, the gallery. The exhibition was also uh, fortunate enough to, to benefit from the installation expertise of NID alumni, uh, the late Aziz Kachwala, whose interventions were critical in the coming together and the hanging. Um, of, of this exhibition. The exhibition was able to secure loans from all over the country and uh, Ushmita was able to create fantastic narratives around moments in Muzumda's career. I would highlight one here, which is on the left hand, this, the uh, image on the left hand side. You can see here in the image of the photograph of the building, the black and white image of the building there, that's uh, architectural reference which Mazumda took and then transcribed as a motif on a sari. And so there in the, in the lower register, you can actually see the block which was made in order to then create the final product, which you see being modeled by none other than Monica Courier, as I touched on earlier, Charles had designed Ritin's, uh, Mazumda's home in Delhi, and uh, they, they were very close. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you then see an image of, indeed, a sari in the collection of Monica Korea, made, designed by Riten Muzumda. So these were these 
really wonderful little vignettes that uh, Ushmita made for, for the exhibition. Here then are some other examples of Muzumda's works. And in this installation image on the left-hand side, then you can see examples of his late uh, paintings of which K.G. Subramanian had this to say in a eulogy to Muzumda written in 2006. Around about 1980, both of us gravitated in our different ways to Shantinikit. As soon as he, Muzumda, moved in, he set up studio and did a series of paintings in dyes on st stretched silk. They were all impeccably designed clusters of color washes and calligraphic motifs. A lot of calligraphy was based on the initial lines of Rabindranath Tagore's touching poem, Dinanta Balai. And here you see examples of that. Moving on to the most recent example of an exhibition looking at design histories was this, the unpaved, crusty, earthy road, Nelly Setna, a retrospective. Having studied both in the UK and then at the Cranbrook Academy of Art in the USA, and having worked for textile companies, including uh, Bombay Dyeing in India, Setna created an extraordinary body of work from the 1960s to her death in 1992. Her works were mainly textile based, but amid the many commissions she was awarded, there were also those that expanded her use of material. Uh, here you see examples of textiles and tapestries. And here you see an, the extraordinary mural commission she made for the lobby of the Express Tower in Bombay in the early 1970s. We have had uh, Chachi and Alice had the pleasure of working with uh, Feroza, Dr. Feroza Godridge and her, on her collection for a number of years. And so we were thrilled to be invited to participate in a series of events planned around Simrosa at 50, which is the name of the gallery Dr. Godridge opened uh, in the early 70s. And it was a celebration of her engagement with art and design, both as a patron and as a gallerist. Now, Dr. Godridge had been a major supporter of Nelly Setna during her lifetime and had massed a fantastic group of examples of her work. And indeed, we had shown some of those uh, in the Impact exhibition of which images I showed you earlier. At the same time, Nancy Adajania, the curator, cultural historian, had been researching Setna's life and work ever since the landmark exhibition she co-curated with Ranjit Hoskote, No Parsi is an Island, uh, which began, of course, in at the NGMA in Mumbai in two 2013, and which had included also Setna's work. It was natural, therefore, for us to request to host as part of Simrosa at 50 celebrations, the first retrospective of Nelly Setna since her death, uh, which Nancy had kindly agreed to curate. The exhibition, was installed in a brilliant fashion by Eve Lamel and included Setna's own fiber art pieces, as well as those of her main assistant, Roshan Mullen. A large section of the exhibition was devoted to Adijania's notes from my research journal, which included a chronology of Setna's life and work, really the first time that such a thing had been attempted in such a systematic fashion, and which included much groundbreaking research, including information about Setna's pioneering work on the tradition of Kalamkari textiles. So this was in late 2021. So really thinking about now and anticipating a design gallery ecosystem 
some of which I think I have already touched upon as part of uh, this lecture and which I think others have also touched upon as part of their sessions earlier in, in the symposium session. First, I want to just think about the major design exhibition interventions that we have seen in the post-independence period in advance of a design gallery ecosystem. In particular, here I'm thinking of the domestic and international design expos and festivals which have taken place with giants in the industry such as Pupu Jeka, Dashat Patel, Jyoti Bhatt, Hakusha, Ritain Muzumda, and of course Rajiv Sethi. Then I would like to point to Martin Singh's interventions between 1981 and 1991 in his Vishwakarma exhibitions on textiles, which was of course reprised in 2018 with the wonderful A Search in Five Directions presented by the Davy Art Foundation and the National Handicrafts and Handlooms Museum in Delhi, Crafts Museum, um, and created, uh, curated of course by Uta Kapoor Chisti, Rakesh Thakur, Thakur and Rahul Jain. Um, continuing with other state level interventions, I would look to, of course, Bharat Bhavan in Bhopal and the National Crafts Museum in Delhi. In terms of private initiatives, in the recent past, I would look to Anapurna Garimela's and Jackfruit Research uh, Design uh, Interventions with the 2011 exhibition with Davy Art Foundation, a Vernacular in the Contemporary and her, their 2018 exhibition at the Birama Museum in Mumbai, Mutable Ceramics. Uh, then of course, Mayank Mansing Kul, uh, who is, to those who don't know, a curator of textiles, uh, who curated major exhibitions such as New Traditions and Inspirations in Indian Textiles 1947 to 2017, and Crossroads, Textile Journeys with Ritu Kumar, in 2018. Uh, Tanishka Kachru, who's faculty at NID and has curated exhibitions such as Nakashima at NID and the scholarly work of Haku Shah, votive terracotta of India. And of course, Pramod Kumar KG and Dipti Shashidharan uh, with Acre Resources, who have curated exhibitions such as Westscapes at uh, the Serendipity Festival. So clearly there's already been a great legacy of design exhibition history in India, but perhaps we're now entering into a new phase where we're looking at the role of the gallery itself. Um, just three months ago, uh, Darani Jindal opened a design gallery in Bombay called Ekwal, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, who, and the gallery describes itself wherein th three actors meet with equal fascination, material makers and designers. And they've just finished their first exhibition called Raw. And I think the premise has been thus far bringing in uh, international designers and having them collaborate with local crafts people around India. And I think that I believe that that's going to be the thrust of their future programming. In our case, uh, Chatterjee and Lal will now proceed with a new entity called Chatterjee and Lal Design. And indeed, I'm happy to say that we will be collaborating on a new space as well called 47A, which will be in uh, an area called Kotachivadi in Girgaon in South Mumbai, and you're seeing a, a uh, drone view of the area. And we are collaborating with Srila Chatterjee of Barrow Market fame on that project. For us, the uh, resonance of Kotachivadi is very clear because of its own history with design built in the 18th century and many of the buildings dating from around the mid 19th century, uh, built originally by um, the East Inc Indian community and in a Portuguese colonial style. The area has retained a lot of its original design sensibility and really functions as an enclave of a little 
little Bombay within a Bombay, and for us seemed a natural fit for show, the showing of design. In around 2013-14, the area was under the research uh, focus of herbs and uh, Rahul Shivastav, who created an extraordinary research, uh, extraordinary research material about the area and really thought about how one could re-engage with the local community to create a new vibrant ecosystem for not only uh, in uh, residents of the area, but also bringing in new audiences. And really we've taken that, the legacy of that research through into what we're trying to do now in 2022 and opening of a design gallery. Here you can see images of what the area looks like. So now drawing uh, towards the close of my presentation, I wanted to return to my initial conversation around the role of memory sites within the art and design sphere. Recently, I was fortunate enough to be the editor of a book called Moving Focus India, New Perspectives on Modern and Contemporary Art, which looked to 54 artists, curators, art historians, critics, and asked them to select five artworks that mean something to them and to write a hundred words about each of those artworks. And then we compiled all of those into a two volume book. It was extraordinary for me to see the diversity of choices amongst our group. But at the same time, it was fascinating to see the overlaps as well. And this started me thinking about the role of collective memory as I hinted earlier, Maurice Helbwax, writing in the first half of the 20th century, had laid emphasis on the idea that collective memories are continually being reshaped in the minds of the living. And then developing on Helbwax's theory in the late 1980, Pierre Nora, as I, as I had said earlier, introduced the concept of memory sites. Nora's breakthrough was to point out that memories tend to coalesce around material and non-material entities, such as objects, people, languages, or historical events. Where history tends to reconstruct what is no longer, memory sites continue to provide grounds for debate and reinterpretation, especially to groups linked by heritage, professional interest, or some other connection. They can be useful in recuperating particular ideas or concepts that may otherwise be lost in received histories. Historical monuments, buildings, and statues are a good example of this phenomenon. Each generation tends to produce fresh perspectives around such sites, and the way collective memory develops over time often says more about the present moment than it does about the period in which the sites were constructed. The Babri Masjid in Ayodhya is but the most celebrated of a host of contested spaces in the Indian context. And memory sites don't need only to be solid objects, of course. An organization could well be one. For instance, Olga Saudi has shown how Bodhi Art, a gallery that showed Indian art in the mid-2000s and closed in 2009, now functions as a memory site for the Indian art community. Her account convincingly argues that collective memory around Bodhi has been shaped by subsequent historical fluctuations in the commercial gallery sector. In other words, art market actors use the memory site of Bodhi art to reflect concerns and issues that arose both during the time that the gallery functioned and since, and since its demise. I believe that the group identity of the Indian art community and separately, the Indian design community has been formed with memory sites at its bedrock. And of course, naturally, tensions around group identity will form when memory sites are modified or replaced by new ones. The introduction of design objects into a gallery context previously dominated in India by a predominantly fine art discourse 
raises the question of whether we possess the critical tools to adequately engage with these objects, given that they have their own very particular lineages. To be more precise, is there easy and ready access to the resources of collective memory and by extension memory sites, which could help inform a critical framework? I am doubtful. As such, it might well be necessary to look to colleagues in the design field for help in coming to grips with this lack. To begin with, any discussion of design in India has to acknowledge the importance of the makers of the design objects and also the craft sector, as well as the role of the state in its operation. Organizations such as the All India Handicrafts Board and the Weaver Service Center have been key institutions in this respect. Here, power dynamics operate in a very different context than those in the fine art sphere. Moreover, unlike fine art, the attitude of the state towards crafts before and after independence actually reveal a remarkable degree of continuity. As Abigail McGowan puts it, exploitation remained rife as artisans became, quote, more and more dependent on outsider leadership thanks to the increased bureaucratic reach of the Indian state, close, close quote. The inherent power in, in inequalities that function within the craft sector in India have inevitable ramifications for the functioning of the entire design industry. These realities may well be hidden to the many in the fine arts sector, who often only encounter design objects in gallery spaces quite divorced, either from their original functional context or from the very materiality that went into their production in the first place. The increasing interdisciplinary incursion of design into the discourse of modern and contemporary art in India is an exciting chance for the arts ecosystem, both to challenge as well as to widen the existing canon. Memory sites such as the Weaver Service Center are prime sources for investigation and can potentially yield rich material in this regard. I would just end by saying that I think that memory sites can themselves perhaps be equipped to handle contemporary concepts and Chatterjee and Lal's remit with design will certainly be wide enough to incorporate the genre as defined by the concept of service as articulated by Ashok Chatterjee, which perhaps in today's design language can also be interpreted within a similar paradigm as Alice Rothson's attitudinal design. Here, for example, one could even think of an area such as computer coding and its relationship to real world solutions as the subject of viable ex exhibitions. And of course, I just picked that one out of my hat, but there are so many examples of deep design, as it were, functioning at many different levels, uh, often not visible uh, and not purely expressed within uh, immediate aesthetics, as it were, which could be incredibly interesting and productive to think about within an exhibition context. So I have reached the end of my presentation and my time limit. So with that, Ushmita, I am going to stop sharing. Thank you, Maud. That was brilliant. And, uh, you know, this, this conversation that I think has been started with the symposium, you, you connect a lot of uh, the questions that have been raised, a lot of the concerns. And especially where you end uh, with talking about design as a service, as uh, you know, we started with that with Professor Ashok Chatterjee, and this has been uh, something that has uh, run through. Sometimes it is obvious in how uh, design is service, but sometimes we do blur the lines, especially when we talk about artists, uh, craftsmen, designers, and, and how these things overlap and how, how the, the understanding of design has developed, as you also rightly pointed out, and how you're trying to unravel it through these various instances of exhibition making, uh, whether it is about um, you know, Sunil Jana's uh, photography of not just um, uh, industrial design, but also, uh, you know, how how then Mitter uh documents, uh, uh, you know, uh, the changing face of uh, design and advertisements in the 1970s. But also, interestingly, um, you start with Hussein and Leela and the toys, 
and uh, you 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 bring uh, his toys and this idea of a nationalist or a indian uh, design sensibility so there's a lot to unpack within what you have uh, you know discussed within the last one hour but but one point i want to start from where you end and that is uh, you do talk about um, you know how you and congratulations by the way uh, for uh, the new space and so excited to see what what comes forth next but but this this idea of starting a design gallery obviously then you know uh, brings its other institutional memories or uh, as you call this this idea notion of what the memory of an institution is so how how do you uh, plan uh, a design gallery and are there any um, examples that you look towards or you can discuss within uh, history uh, in any part of the world that that you perhaps look at and and the importance of what what the discourse has been there and how you uh, would like to reflect on that Yes, thank you, Ushmita. Thank, thanks so much for, the, for this prompt. I think that, uh, as I even said at the outset in the synopsis for this, for this session today, I do see an analogy between where we are in 2022 and the emergence of design galleries with the situation as it presented itself in the early 2000s and the contemporary art sphere. And at that time, moving into a new space and creating a gallery, it was clear that the role of the gallery was performing at different registers, not only within the commercial sphere, but also because of the absence of institutional support. The role was added to of somewhat, of, let's say, museumizing somewhat the exhibiting and display of contemporary art. And I feel that again with design in 2022, I think any design gallery in India must take on some responsibility to think within a broader remit than only purely the commercial, precisely because without context, showing contemporary art or contemporary design seems to me operating within some kind of vacuum. And of course, neither design nor art ever does operate within a vacuum. And unless we can contextualize the object, I think we, we start off on a very wobbly basis. I'm constantly excited to think about what happens to an object once it goes within a gallery space and what conversations does it have with a more general history of either design or art? So to answer your specific question about influences, uh, I would look to spaces such as the v &A in the UK, the Victor Design Museum in, in Germany. I mean, the major uh, encyclopedic uh, museums in the US, even the, the Met, of course, it's extraordinary um, design. Uh, has had extraordinary design interventions. Um, let's not forget even the MoMA, which uh, in earlier design uh, sessions, the design symposium sessions, I think I, I Rebecca was talking about um, the 1955 arts, uh, the ornamental textiles exhibition. Of course, in 2022, we have a, now another exhibition at MoMA looking at South Asian architecture. Uh, which is really a first of its kind mm. and something again I'm I'm astounded that we really haven't had such an exhibition ourselves in South Asia so I think one would certainly look to to that in terms of the commercial design gallery sphere uh, one would look at the Cap Carpenters workshop of course in America Salon 94 so I think there are a number of different uh, precedents uh, that I would look to. And it, I think that we obviously have to understand that we, we're operating in a unique environment here in India. So one has to sort of tailor make, create a bespoke model. Hmm. Very rightly, uh, yeah, so because 
it's it's a very very regional ecosystem that has developed organically and it has uh, such vast historical uh, you know uh, precedents for instance when you were talking about hussein and his uh, idea of the indian in design i was and and when you talked about you know he had this uh, design of a hut uh, the the front of a hut in one of his designs i was reminded of uh, nandalal bose's uh, haripura uh, or the faizpur Uh, designs which Gandhi actually, in a way, I wouldn't use the word commission, but it was a commission project to uh, talk about a nationalistic approach to design again as a service. Uh, we we come back to that idea that here is an artist uh, who has great um, uh, knowledge of uh, indigenous crafts uh, being invited by Gandhi and using his services as a political design. so there is that historical context as well that uh, you know we need to understand that has developed within uh, indian contexts quite so and in fact that that little quote that i um, gave of elias moizuddin speaking about notions of communal harmony at the at the level of chi- uh, children being worked on through design and through furniture i thought was a precise example of what professor chatterjee talks about when he thinks about designer service because here here is a living example in 1948 of someone saying listen we can do something about the problems we have through the way that we approach design itself yeah it is it's interesting that you know when you read that out it also again reflected in my mind gandhi's naitalim but also before that there was whole patobhavan and and the sriniketan thing that uh, you know experiment that uh, shivakumar was professor yes. shivakumar was talking about the other day so so we do have those you know i think there were multiple nodes uh, of parallel thoughts and parallel working processes in how design uh, was also designing the new nation as as yeah. you did talk about at the nehruvian moment of popul jaikar and how craft and design was yeah. not just used to um, create an image of india outside india but also how later uh, yeah. you know the soft politics of uh, the american government and how again i think design becomes an underlying way of understanding service but also a larger schema of uh, how nation building is approached um, yeah. yeah do you have no, some yeah. reflections on that No, I, I absolutely agree with you, and I think that what what becomes interesting for me is that, as someone coming from a visual arts background, often uh, it, it's interesting that painters and artists actually would, in my in my limited understanding, would not used in such a forceful manner within this kind of soft power um, co- uh, trade between uh, countries. somehow it seems to be design sort of was led from the front with art kind of taking somewhat of a more invisible role within that uh, transaction and i've i've wondered why that is that in a set, especially during that key period of let's say 50s 60s when as we know of course abstraction plays its its, its key part in um, the mode of uh, ex- artistic ex- expression but therefore politics of often wasn't actually at the for, at the forefront of artistic concerns mm-hmm. and so as a result i think therefore is the design community that sort of and that's where dashrath patel of course and some of them the 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 um question marks about how whether he became in fact some a, a pawn for um the political uh, powers that be at that time especially within kind of the the, the context of the experts um, and i think that there must have been quite a lot of pressure on on these people's shoulders in a way that perhaps was not there on some of our, our artists or, or some of their artists peers yeah. that's that's a very interesting point that you raised but also i mean connecting it in a way to the viva service center where you see a predominance of the artist as a designer and yeah. uh, in in that sphere the artist is brought into obviously uh, add experimental design or new languages to explore which then 
uh, the craft or the handicraft sector can create. But uh, does this has this also led to this blurring of what how we understand design? Because frankly, I come not from a design background, so it has taken a long time for me to understand what Professor Chatterjee means as design. You know, uh, coming from Shantiniketan, especially design as part of everyday life activity. Uh, as again uh, started by Nandalal Bose in his curriculum uh, where the act of making an alpona or a flow graphic a design is when I asked Professor Chatterjee this and this was a very interesting conversation we had had at one point that is this a service or is this an aesthetic uh, approach so I think and he said that even an aesthetic approach is a kind of service to society so we, we kind of need to understand, you know, that that kind of a approach. And so my question to you is, when when a gallery uh, which has predominantly worked in fine arts, uh, you find a space to talk about design histories and as service, uh, do you see a kind of an overlap happening, or uh, is that something that? You are very aware of, and the programming remains quite separate uh, between the two uh, inst organizations. Yeah, I think that's a question, sadly, that I'm not going to be able to answer until we really get going with our program. What I can say is that the reason why it made sense for us to um, bifurcate, in some sense, the exhibitions between two spaces has something to do with the conversation I ended my presentation with, which is really thinking about this idea of memory sites, collective memory, and conversations that are specific to the design community and the conversations that are specific to the fine art community. And when I have spoken about this in the past, I have said that I feel like an interloper within the design community. Now that I'm making a clear claim to be part of it, I feel that it's incumbent on me to do that in a context that is very specifically tailored towards that one conversation. Not that I'm co-opting a conversation around design within a larger paradigm of the fine arts discourse, because that I think that's precisely where somewhat shallow readings of design histories can occur not only shallow readings, but sometimes it's kind of like an unintentional blindness because mm. the kinds of um, language that we use in the fine arts ecosystem is shaped by our collective memory within that fine arts ecosystem. And there is an entirely parallel design history ecosystem through which there is a different type of discourse. So increasingly for us having these two types of conversations happening in the same space was becoming problematic uh, uh, in my mind now whether or not i we just need to have some time of operating two parallel spaces in order to become clearer as to how one can negotiate those, those separate conversations i don't know or whether they permanently need to be separated is, an, is a question i think that uh, I, I can't answer now but I, I think that um, it's really uppermost at, in my mind at this present second as we speak. Yeah. Mm. Because I, I, I completely understand this position, especially when uh, you know researching on Ritin who starts out as an artist, you know, becomes a big name in the design, you know, the nascent design, uh, modernist design world, and then goes back to being an artist. Now, in the beginning, his design is obviously informed by his artistic practices, but in his later stage, his paintings are informed by his, uh, you know, the techniques, the material, the, the language of his design. So how do you uh, separate, uh, you know, this, this discourse of uh, service versus art? Uh, so that has been a constant uh, negotiation. Uh, even while I uh, do the research. And, and I think that's interesting even with Subramanyam when I was looking at the slide that you presented on one hand is the design, Viva Service Center designs, 
and on the other slide you had the, the works that were informed by that so um, would you want to reflect a little bit yeah i mean in, i would love to redo the whole of that impact ex exhibition at the new design space and in fact i i'm having my cake and i'm eating it because <laughs> i'm sort of doing that in the first exhibition that we're going to open in april so okay. we're actually going we're going to revisit a lot of impact now in the next uh, in the next couple of weeks you'll probably be getting an email from us requesting some <laughs> things <laughs> anyway so but, but and so when we do that it's going to give us an opportunity to come fresh to this material within within a design history discourse in a way that perhaps uh, we didn't the first time around where we sort of were hell-bent on insisting Subramanian is an artist and oh look by the way here are some designs that he also did now I'm much more interested in the way that here is Subramanian the designer deeply influencing his later work within a within a fine arts context and I think that that sh that is kind of a paradigm shift within my mind um, really and I think you you indicated it with Mazunda as well it's you kind of learn from the research you, you just have to keep your eyes and ears open to what you're reading and listening to and you kind of allow yourself to be led by what what you're being told by the material itself so that, uh, that's really my, my answer mm -hmm. by the way a little bit of a, a tidbit of an information um, it was actually Ruten Mozumdar who got the job at the Viva Service Center in the 90, 1950 but he got the uh, the scholarship to go to study in Yugoslavia hence he asked Manida whether he would want to take that job <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, there are these connections and both were friends, as you know, and uh, yeah. so, so, so that's, that's an interesting thought that uh, occurred to me when you were talking about um, the Viva Service Centre. Yeah, and again, these interconnections between people like Muzunda to, to KG, to KG Subramanian, to Charles Courier, these kinds of uh, networks that were operating throughout India. Now, of course, it was entirely interdisciplinary. That's not to say that there weren't clear um, design history trajectories within which they were operating. They were they were extremely well read people, and they knew they were not just lending, just putting putting a hand to whatever they wanted to as they woke up in the morning. Every day. they they were they were clear in each mode that they operated. They had they were very clear about the paradigm within which they were functioning. And I think we need to respect that because um, otherwise we really can't do justice to, to, to excavating their own uh, practices. And of course, as um, both of you and I are interested in these working with estates, I think as we go forward as a community, it's kind of being sensitive to these, to these individual histories that will allow us to, to learn a, a lot more about that time and about how each of these actors were operating within a larger network sadly much of which is now being lost because of course those those people are no longer with us and the oral histories were not taken i i wonder really i wonder why that was not the case why there was not a more active um, push to create oral histories especially during the 90, the 80s and 90s it seemed extraordinary like an extraordinary lapse that, that and I don't, which means I don't know why, whether you have any explanation about um, why that happened. I, I don't have an explanation, but I do have an observation. Um, so when, when I was taking interviews, and I was lucky uh, to have taken, um, you know, I interviewed Jasbir Sajdev before he passed. Uh, I did speak with the uh, contractor before she passed, but uh, unfortunately that was not a recorded conversation. I also spoke with, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I, uh, the name is skipping me. But uh, having talked to some some of Ritan Mazumdar's friends, uh, colleagues, uh, you know, everybody had this this kind of an idea that design was less important because it was to do with everyday life things which you use. Hence, when we did our exhibition, so many people have come up even now as the exhibition is still running in Kolkata, people have come up and said, oh, 
if we had known that the Mazumdar's you know designs from Fab India would would be so important, we would not have used them. We would have framed and uh, put them on the wall. So design uh, is a service. The service is for the people, for the client, and people use that object. Hence, the utility of the object perhaps uh, creates that um, that idea in in the mind that art being a non-utilitarian object has more value than this. Um, you know, so so I think that's that's again you know a very interesting thing that's that's come up in my research about how Tagore and his family uh, in the early years of the 1900s or the late 1800s uh, were already thinking about this discourse that uh, uh, indigenous crafts are being lost. We should document it. We should keep it. You know, we should record it. And they did a lot. They did record a lot of, uh, you know, uh, indigenous art from uh, Bengal. They collected a lot of it. Um, and they understood the importance of it. Hence, it it you know reflected in the curriculum there. And Gandhi understood the importance of it. Hence, you know, but in a different way from Tagore, obviously. Yeah. Uh, 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 so, but it did reflect in that. So I think that this idea, this notion of uh, what is everyday, of not being of the highest aesthetical order. Uh, hence, not worthy of record keeping, perhaps may have been have played the kind of villain yeah. uh, of the piece. No, I think you're right. And I, if I may, uh, what what I I feel with skirt, I think the issue with skirting around is one of value and the uh, and the intrinsic value that we place on the object. And of course, it's exactly the same in the fine art sphere. Collections which were, I mean, I I um, helped with the TIFR art collection in Bombay. It was a collection that was really neglected during a significant portion of time in, in the 70s and 80s. Why was that? Well, I mean, if we're being absolutely honest about it, it's because the value had not yet entered into the market for Indian art. And I, I promise you this, that it's the, the, half the reason that, of course, people are now talking about within Mazumda and why didn't I keep it because the value has 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 changed substantially. Exactly. Now I think we need to be very we, we need to be very honest about this because of course I'm I'm a commercial gallerist and it's in my interest to create value out of these design objects. At the same time, my argument from the beginning is that one can only do that when one is sensitive to the specific histories that one is operating within. To pretend that a design object, and this is where I feel that contemporary art galleries have, have missed a trick in the last 10 years, is that they have taken essentially design objects and then tried to move them within an art language to give them the same value as art objects, rather than talking about them within a design language and giving them their own intrinsic value through that lineage, which I think is a, it's a much more honest way of going about this uh, procedure of, of inculcating value in, into those design objects. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's why it's important to go back and reassess or, you know, dust off the, uh, you know, the layers of uh, apathy and the years in between because you know about the Air India collection. I mean, when when we were trying to locate uh, Ritain's work in the Air India collection or uh, much of what Ritain Mazumdar did for, um, you know, ITT, nothing is there. I mean, absolutely nothing. The Ashoka Hotel, uh, you know, the, Ash the, uh, the work that he did, uh, they were just taken down and thrown away one fine day because, you know, they were just decor, I suppose, and uh, the new trend of decor had to replace them. So it, it does come down to how we what value we put to um, yeah. these objects. Professor Chatterjee is, has an has a observation. He says, one reason why design histories were not recorded was precisely because design was not given importance as scholarship. At NID, we had no resource for this and struggled to do what we could with a sense of panic that something was being lost that was important. What that something was, we really didn't really know. Yeah, yeah, I, 
think that encapsulates it precisely. Precisely. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I had, uh, you know, as um, I don't see any other questions, um, uh, I, I have one more kind of a question to you. How do you avoid the pitfalls of, uh, you know, making a, a similar kind of uh, uh, mistakes of what uh, sometimes art historical uh, views of looking at design have shown some examples of how do you avoid pitfalls? Uh, I think you have answered this in the, in bits and parts, but if you would yeah, collect I, yeah. the thoughts, Pushmita, I think it's very clear that we need to learn from our design from our colleagues in, in the design community. I think there's been too little of that. I think we've taken we've um, been um, fairly deaf to the learnings that are there if we just are willing to listen to what people like Professor Chatterjee have been saying for, for decades. Um, young curators, someone like my Man Singh Kaur is, you know, so just let's let's listen to them. Let's learn learn from them. I think that it's very clear that uh, the art community has a lot to, to learn at this point in time. But do you That's think right. there, there could be a trap of falling into the, the over-commercialization because you did you know, mention that it was about archiving, it was about you know, looking back, creating this course, exhibiting the object within uh, a, a gallery and then uh, you know, understanding the cross-currents. But it is also at the end of the day about commerce. But this is a secondary kind of commerce, not the commerce of the design object being created for uh, dissemination, but it is uh, putting value on the design objects. Do you see that uh, going through the pitfalls of what you call the Bodhi effect, uh, perhaps? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, that's a really great. That's a really great, great question. I don't. I don't know the answer to that at this point in time. I think these this precise point we can only answer in another five to ten years i think as as we progress as a community and i think we're all going to make mistakes because that's the nature of any enterprise like this but i do think these often these failures can be very productive <laughs> that's one thing what i hope is obviously where where things went really wrong in the art community was was during the bubble between 2006 and 2008 mm. where valuations were not commensurate with the fair market value and as a result there's a whole generation of artists that have essentially lost their who lost their way because they they were completely out, out price they outpriced themselves uh, due in no small measure because of the gallery system I'm not, I'm not blaming artists themselves at all and I think that there will be a surge of interest in design in the Indian contest, then I would counsel everyone just to keep a level head. That's, that's I think, very well spoken and, and a very important point to make uh, because you know, any, any new field, uh, many players jump in because they see the commercial value. But in this, in this kind of a sector where you are taking design and putting it into a gallery system, you would need a lot of understanding of that particular system where you're borrowing from in a sense and then keeping a level head uh, to to market it or to put a, a, another value on that uh, on that object and um, I think with that uh, as we have no more questions uh, thank you so much Maud I think it was very interesting and I, I congratulate you and Tara on your new venture. I look forward to joining in on the new excursions that happen. No choice. No choice. <laughs> no choice. And happy to happy to join in. And um, we hope to keep continuing this conversation as um, forward. So for those who are still here, tomorrow we are joined by Vishal Kandilwal and his lecture is Design Theory and Criticism in Post-Colonial India. Uh, tomorrow at 6 uh, will be our last session in this seminar series. Uh, once again, a uh, thanks to our uh, partners NIT and JBMRC. Tapatidi is uh, missed today, 
and thank you to all the other participants, speakers, uh, and my backing team. Thanks, Mort. Thanks for your lovely lecture. Thank you. Have a good thank evening. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Good night. Good night.